the necessity, therefore, of a proportion of money to trade, depends on money, not as counters, for the reckoning may be kept, or transferred by writing, but on money as a pledge, which writing cannot supply the place of, since the bill, bond, or other note of debt, I receive from one man, will not be accepted as security by another, he not knowing that the bill or bond is true or legal, or that the man bound to me is honest or responsible, and so is not valuable enough to become a current pledge, nor can by public authority be well made so, as in the case of assigning of bills, because a law cannot give to bills that intrinsic value, which the universal consent of mankind has annexed to silver and gold, and hence foreigners can never be brought to take your bills or writings, for any part of payment, though perhaps they might pass as valuable considerations among your own people, did not this very much hinder it, viz. that they are liable to unavoidable doubt, dispute, and counterfeiting, and require other proofs to assure us that they are true and good security, than our eyes, or a touchstone, and, at best, this course, if a practicable, will not hinder us from being poor, but may be suspected to help to make us so, by keeping us from feeling our poverty, which, in distress, will be sure to find us with greater disadvantage, though it be certain it is better than letting any part of our trade fall for want of current pledges, and better too than borrowing money of our neighbours upon use, if this way of assigning bills can be made so easy, safe, and universal at home, as to hinder it to return to the business in hand, and show the necessity of a proportion of money to trade, every man must have at least so much money, or so timely recruits, as may in hand, or in a short distance of time, satisfy his creditor who supplies him with the necessaries of life, or of his trade, for nobody has any longer these necessary supplies, than he his money, or credit, which is nothing else but an assurance of money, in some short time, so that it is requisite to trade, that there should be so much money as to keep up the landholders, laborers, and brokers' credit, and therefore ready money must be constantly exchanged for wares and labor, or follow within a short time after. This shows the necessity of some proportion of money to trade, but what proportion that is, is hard to determine, because it depends not barely on the quantity of money, but the quickness of its circulation. The very same shilling may, at one time, pay twenty men in twenty days, at another, rest in the same hands one hundred days together. This makes it impossible exactly to estimate the quantity of money needful in trade, but, to make some probable guess, we are to consider how much money it is necessary to suppose must rest constantly in each man's hands, as requisite to the carrying on of trade. First, therefore, the laborers, living generally but from hand to mouth, and, indeed, considered as laborers in order to trade, may well enough carry on their part, if they have but money enough to buy victuals, clothes, and tools, all which may very well be provided, without any great sum of money lying still in their hands. The laborers, therefore, being usually paid once a week, if the times of payment be seldom or there must be more money for the carrying on this part of trade, we may suppose there is constantly amongst them, one with another, or those who are to pay them, always one week's wages in ready money, for it cannot be thought, that all or most of the laborers pay away all their wages constantly, as soon as they receive it, and live upon trust till next pay day. This the farmer and tradesman could not well bear were it every laborer's case, and every one to be trusted, and, therefore, they must of necessity keep some money in their hands, to go to market for victuals, and to other tradesmen as poor as themselves, for tools, and lay up money too to buy clothes, or pay for those they bought upon credit, which money, thus necessarily resting in their hands, we cannot imagine to be, one with another, much less than a week's wages that must be in their pockets, already in the farmer's hands, for he, who employs a laborer at a shilling per day, and pays him on Saturday nights, cannot be supposed constantly to receive that six shillings, just the same Saturday, it must ordinarily be in his hands one time with another, if not a whole week, yet several days before. This was the ordinary course, whilst we had money running in the several channels of commerce, 
But that now very much failing, and the farmer not having money to pay the laborer, supplies him with corn, which, in this great plenty, the laborer will have at his own rate, or else not take it off his hands for wages. And as for the workmen, who are employed in our manufactures, especially the woolen one, these the clothier, not having ready money to pay, furnishes with the necessaries of life, and so trucks commodities for work, which, such as they are, good or bad, the workman must take at his master's rate, or sit still and starve, whilst by this means this new sort of engrossers, or forestallers, having the feeding and supplying this numerous body of workmen out of their warehouses, for they have now magazines of all sorts of wares, set the price upon the poor landholder, so that the markets, now being destroyed, and the farmer not finding vent for his butter, cheese, bacon, and corn, etc. for which he was wont to bring home ready money, must sell it to these engrossers on their own terms of time and rate, and allow it to their own day laborers under the true market price. What kind of influence this is like to have upon land, and how this way rents are like to be paid at quarter day, is easy to apprehend, and it is no wonder to hear every day of farmers breaking and running away for if they cannot receive money for their goods at market, it will be impossible for them to pay their landlord's rent. If any one doubt whether this be so, I desire him to inquire how many farmers in the West are broke, and gone, since Michael Elmer's last want of money, being to this degree, works both ways upon the landholder. For, first, the engrossing forest all lets not the money come to market, but supplying the workman, who is employed by him in manufacture with necessaries, imposes his price, and forbearance on the farmer, who cannot sell to the others, and the laborer who is employed by the landholder in husbandry, imposes also his rate on him for the commodities he takes, for the being a want of day laborers in the country, they must be humored, or else they will neither work for you, nor take your commodities for their labor. Secondly, as for the landholder, since his tenants cannot coin their rent just at quarter day, but must gather it up by degrees, and lodge it with them till payday, or borrow it of those who have it lying by them, or do gather it up by degrees, which is the same thing, and must be necessarily so much money for some time lying still, for all that is paid in great sums, must somewhere be gathered up by the retail incomes of a trade, or else lie still too in great sums, which is the same stop of money, or a greater. Add to this, that to pay the creditor that lent him his rent, he must gather up money by degrees, as the sale of his commodities shall bring it in, and so makes a greater stop, and greater want of money, since the borrowed money, that paid the landholder the 25th of March, must be supposed to lie still some time in the creditor's hand, before he lent it the tenant, and the money that pays the creditor, three months after, must lie still some time in the tenants, nor does the landlord pay away his rent usually as soon as he receives it, but by degrees, as his occasions call for it. All this considered, we cannot but suppose that between the landlord and tenant, there must necessarily be at least a quarter of the yearly revenue of the land constantly in their hands. Indeed, considering that most part of the rents of England are paid at Lady Day and Michael Elmer's, and that the same money which pays me my rent from my tenant the 25th of March, or thereabouts, cannot pay my next neighbor his rent from his tenant at the same time, much less one more remote in another country, it might seem requisite to suppose half the yearly revenue of the land to be necessarily employed in paying of rent, for to say that some tenants break, and pay not their rent at all, and others pay not till two, three, four, five, six, etc. months after quarter day, and so the rent is not all paid at one time, is no more than to say, that there is money wanting to the trade, for if the tenant fail the landlord, he must fail his creditor, and he his, and so on, till somebody break, and so trade decay for want of money. But since a considerable part of the land of England is in the owner's hands, who neither pay nor receive great sums for it at a certain day, because too, which is the chief reason, we are not to consider here how much money is in any one man's, or any one sort of men's hands, at one time, for that at other times may be distributed into other hands, and serve other parts of trade, 
but how much money is necessary to be in each man's hands all the year round, taking one time with another, 1. e. Having 300 pounds in his hand one month, is to be reckoned as 100 pounds in his hand three months, and so proportionably, I think we may well suppose a quarter of the yearly revenue to be constantly in the landlord's or tenant's hands. Here by the by, we may observe, that it were better for trade, and consequently for everybody, for more money would be stirring, and less would do the business, if rents were paid by shorter intervals than six months, for, supposing I let a farm at £52 per annum, If my rent be paid half yearly, there are £26 to be employed in the payment of it in one entire sum, if it be paid well, and if it be not paid well, for want of so much money to be spared to that purpose, there is so much want of money, and trade is still endamaged by it, a great part whereof must necessarily lie still, before it come out of my tenant's chest to my hands, if it be paid once a quarter, thirteen pounds alone will do it, and less money is laid up for it, and stopped a less while in its course, but should it be paid every week, one single twenty shillings will pay the rent of fifty-two pounds per annum. Whence would follow this double benefit, first, that a great deal less money would serve for the trade of a country, and, secondly, that less of the money would lie still, the contrary whereof must needs happen, where growing debts are to be paid at larger distances, and in greater sums. Thirdly, as for the brokers, since they too must lay up the money, coming in by retail, either to go to market, and buy wares, or to pay at the day appointed which is often six months, for those wares which they have already, we cannot suppose them to have less by them, one with another, than one twentieth part of their yearly returns, whether the money be their own, or they be indebted so much, or more, it matters not, if it be necessary they should have constantly by them, comparing one time with another, at least one twentieth part of their yearly return, indeed, in some great towns, where the bankers are ready at hand to buy bills, or any other way to lend money for a short time at great interest, that perhaps the merchant is not forced to keep so much money by him, as in other places, where they have not such a supply, but if you consider what money to do this must necessarily be constantly lodged in the banker's hands, the case will be much the same. To these sums, if you add what part of the money of a country scholars of all sorts, women, gamesters, and great men's menial servants, and all such that do not contribute at all to trade, either as landholders, laborers, or brokers, will unavoidably have constantly in their hands, it cannot well be thought that less than one fiftieth part of the laborer's wages, one fourth part of the landholder's yearly revenue, and one twentieth part of the broker's yearly returns in ready money, will be enough to drive the trade of any country. At least to put it beyond exception low enough, it cannot be imagined that less than one moiety of this, one e. less than one hundredth part of the laborer's yearly wages, one eighth part of the landholder's yearly revenue, and one fortieth part of the broker's yearly returns, in ready money, can be enough to move the several wheels of trade, and keep up commerce, in that life and thriving posture it should be and how much the ready cash of any country is short of this proportion, so much must the trade be impaired and hindered for want of money. But however these measures may be mistaken, this is evident, that the multiplying of brokers hinders the trade of any country, by making the circuit, which the money goes, larger, and in that circuit more stops, so that the returns must necessarily be slower and scantier, to the prejudice of trade. Besides that, they eat up too great a share of the gains of trade, by that means starving the laborer, and impoverishing the landholder, whose interest is chiefly to be taken care of, it being a settled, unmovable concernment in the commonwealth. If this be so, it is past question that all encouragement should be given to artificers, and things so ordered, as much as might be, that those who make should also vend and retail out their own commodities and they be hindered, as much as possible, from passing here at home, through divers' hands to the last buyer. Lazy and unworking shopkeepers in this being worse than gamesters, that they do not only keep so much of the money of a country constantly in their hands, 
but also make the public pay them for their keeping of it. Though gaming too, upon the account of trade, as well as other reasons, may well deserve to be restrained, since gamesters, in order to their play, keep great sums of money by them, which the lies dead, for though gamesters money shifts masters oftener than any, and is tumbled up and down with every cast of a die, yet as to the public it lies perfectly still, and no more of it comes into trade, than they spend in eating or wearing. Here too we may observe, how much manufacture deserves to be encouraged, since that part of trade, though the most considerable, is driven with the least money, especially if the workmanship be more worth than the materials, for to the trade that is driven by labor and handicraftsmen, one two and fiftieth part of the yearly money paid them will be sufficient, but to a trade of our commodities, of our bare, native growth, much greater proportion of money is required. Perhaps it will be wondered why, having given some estimate, how wide I know not, of the money, necessary in the hands of the landholder, laborer, and broker, to carry on trade, I have said nothing of the consumer, whom I had mentioned before, to this I answer, there are so few consumers, who are not either laborers, brokers, or landholders, that they make a very inconsiderable part in the account, for those who immediately depend on the landholder, as his children and servants, come in under that title, being maintained by the rent of his lands and so of the rest. By what has been said, we may see what injury the lowering of interest is like to do us, by hindering trade, when it shall either make the foreigner call home his money, or your own people backward till end, the reward not being judged proportionable to the risk. Eh? There is another seeming consequence of the reducing of money to a low price, which at first sight has such an appearance of truth in it, that I have known it to impose upon very able men, and I guess it has no small influence, at this time, in the promoting this alteration, and that is, that the low airing of interest will raise the value of all other things in proportion, for money being the counterbalance to all other things purchasable by it, and lying, as it were, in the opposite scale of commerce, it looks like a natural consequence, that as much as you take off from the value of money, so much you add to the price of other things which are exchanged for it, the raising of the price of anything being no more but the addition to its value in respect of money, or, which is all one, lessening the value of money. For example, should the value of gold be brought down to that of silver, one hundred guineas would purchase little more corn, wool, or land, than one hundred shillings, and so, the value of money being brought lower, say they, the price of other things will rise, and the falling of interest from six pounds to four pounds per cent, is taking away so much of the price of money, and so consequently the lessening its value. The mistake of this plausible way of reasoning will be easily discovered, when we consider that the measure of the value of money, in proportion to anything purchasable by it, is the quantity of the ready money we have in comparison with the quantity of that thing, and its vent, or which amounts to the same thing, the price of any commodity rises or falls by the proportion of the number of buyers and sellers, this rule holds universally in all things that are to be bought and sold, baiting now and then an extravagant fancy of some particular person, which never amounts to so considerable a part of trade, as to make anything in the account worthy to be thought an exception to this rule, the vent of anything depends upon its necessity or usefulness, as convenience or opinion, guided by fancy, or fashion, shall determine. The vent of any commodity comes to be increased, or decreased, as a greater part of the running cash of the nation is designed to be laid out, by several people at the same time, rather in that, than another, as we see in the change of fashions. I shall begin first with the necessaries, or conveniences of life, and the consumable commodities subservient thereunto, and show, that the value of money, in respect of those, depends only on the plenty, or scarcity of money, in proportion to the plenty and scarcity of those things, and not on what interest shall, by necessity, law, or contract, be at that time laid on the borrowing of money, and then afterwards I shall show that the same holds in land. There is nothing more confirmed, by daily experience than that men give any portion of money for whatsoever is absolutely necessary, 
rather than go without it, and in such things, the scarcity of them alone makes their prices. As for example, let us suppose half an ounce of silver, or half a crown now in England, is worth a bushel of wheat, but should there be next year a great scarcity of wheat in England, and a proportionable want of all other food, five ounces of silver would, perhaps, in exchange purchase but one bushel of wheat, so that money would be then nine tenths less worth in respect of food, though at the same value it was before, in respect of other things, that kept their former proportion, in their quantity and consumption. By the like proportions, of increase and decrease, does the value of things, more or less convenient, rise and fall, in respect of money, only with this difference, that things absolutely necessary for life must be had at any rate, but things convenient will be had only as they stand in preference with other conveniences, and therefore in any one of these commodities, the value rises only as its quantity is less, and vent greater, which depends upon its being preferred to other things, in its consumption. For supposing that, at the same time, that there is a great scarcity of wheat, and other grain, there were a considerable quantity of votes, men, no question, would give far more for wheat than oats, as being the healthier, pleasanter, and more convenient food, but, since oats would serve to supply that absolute necessity of sustaining life, men would not rob themselves of all other conveniences of life, by paying all their money for wheat, when oats, that are cheaper, though with some inconvenience, would supply the defect. It may then so happen at the same time, that half an ounce of silver, that the year before would buy one bushel of wheat, will this year buy but one tenth of a bushel, half an ounce of silver, that the year before would have bought three bushels of oats, will this year still buy one, and at the same time half an ounce of silver, that would the year before have bought fifteen pounds of lead, will still buy the same quantity, so that at the same time silver, in respect of wheat, is nine tenths less worth than it was, in respect of oats two thirds less worth, and in respect of lead as much worth as before.